Okay, uh, welcome everybody uh, to today's, to today's uh, forum on uh, trade uh, and investment policy, which is organized by the Seattle to Brussels network. Um, uh, my name is Martin Konechny. I'm the coordinator of the Seattle to Brussels network, and I'm very pleased to have you all here to this uh, forum here today, where we will discuss uh, what is wrong with the current trade and investment regime, how it is shaping our world um, and reinforcing um, the power of big corporations. Um, I'm, and we will, of course, also discuss uh, how to change that, uh, which is a key thing for us as uh, social movements. Uh, to alter the world and uh, change the trade and investment regime in a way that uh, we can implement all the policies that we want in all the fields we care about. Um, I'm very pleased to have here today uh, to my, from my side, far right, from far right, but from your perspective, obviously, the far left, uh, Luciana Giotto, uh, who's working uh, with TNI, the Transnational Institute. She's a professor for uh, international political economy based in Argentina. Uh, she's also active at, with uh, Attack Argentina, and she's also the coordinator of the Better Without Free Trade Agreement, uh, Latin America Better Without Free Trade Agreement Network, uh, which fights um, uh, bilateral and other free trade agreements in uh, Latin America. Uh, to my right, I have uh, Lucia, uh, Lucia Parcena, from, also from TNI, from the Transnational Institute, who specializes on research in uh, the investments, investor state dispute settlement, and in particular on the Energy Charter Treaty, a um, treaty that is, we'll hear more about, and that is one of the key uh, elements that blocks the energy transition that we so urgently need. And she has been also in working on trade uh, she has been also working on trade and investment for many years uh, before uh, in Spain with Ecologistas en Acción and uh, leading the fight against TTIP and other free trade agreements that the EU tried but failed to uh, implement. To my left, uh, I welcome uh, Nick Dearden. Uh, he's director for, um, of Global Justice Now, uh, which is also the uh, British uh, chapter of uh, ATTAC. Um, he was also formerly with Warren Want. Um, and is currently writing a book on ph pharmaceutical companies and how they exploit our health. And she's also been working quite a long time on trade investment policies and also to, um, helped us defeat the TTIP agreement. And not yet announced on the wall here, but also very pleased to have you here, uh, Thomas Köller, who is active with the um, uh, AG Welthandel in, uh, and WTO within the German attack network and is currently focusing on the fight against CETA, the trade agreement between the EU and Canada that we still hope uh, to stop. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody. We'll now have a first round on the panel and I would like to start uh, with uh, Nick to give, him, give us a little bit of an overview on why it is so important that we talk about trade and uh, change the current trade uh, regime. There we are. Is that working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, nice to be here. So, I, yeah, I'm going to explain why, as activists on the left in the movement, we should care about trade. So, afterwards, you can go out and tell everybody else at the conference uh, what I say, and next time they will um, be in here with us. Uh, first, of, first thing to say is that trade today, trade agreements, trade deals, trade rules, really are very little to do with the 19th century version of free trade. Right? So 100 years ago, we talked about free trade, and we were talking about lowering tariffs, lowering the taxes on, on international trade, essentially. Now, whatever you think about tariffs, um, it, it's really not very central to the, to the trade system today. Tariffs are extremely low all around the world. So trade policy has become much, much bigger. Really, I like to say trade policy is, is for the most part the rules of the global economy. The rules of globalization are, are, are what we call trade policy today. And, and that's really happened particularly since the mid-1990s, since the creation of the World Trade Organization. Um, you've come to see a form of trade rule that really embeds corporate power, embeds the power of capital right at its center. And so today, when we talk about trade rules, we're talking, you can't talk about trade rules without talking about the power of capital and the power of corporations in the world. And the power of capital to do 
what it wants, when it wants, where it wants. And if that makes inequality in the world worse, if that makes poverty worse, so be it. You know, if that means burning the planet and shoving the cost onto other parts of the world, onto future generations, so be it. In the end, we're told, it will be good for all of us. Uh, take your medicine um, and, and you will end up with a better world. Now, the linchpin of this system really is the World Trade Organization, but actually, there are thousands of deals that are signed outside the World Trade Organization, trade and investment agreements that also carry the weight of international law. And that's really important because unlike all the stuff we care about, human rights laws, climate laws, whatever, trade and investment agreements are very enforceable. They're enforceable with sanctions at an international level, so they're really important. Now, I want to give you just three examples of what modern trade rules are about, three, exa three different perspectives of, of, of things that are included in modern trade deals, so you can begin to get an idea of, of, of just how far into society this, that they reach. So, first one is regulation. Modern trade deals are far more about regulation than they are about tariffs. You see, if I'm trying to export something to you, um, the fact that you have different regulations from me is a big hassle, right? It's going to cost me money, and I don't want that. They're a pain. So the best thing is if we try to harmonize regulations between our countries. Um, but of course, harmonizing tends to mean lowering, forcing down to the lowest, um, the lowest standard of the, of the partners who are, who are doing the agreement. And of course, the problem for all of us is the regulations weren't invented to make the lives of exporters difficult. They were invented for all sorts of other reasons that we campaigned and we thought were important. So protecting our food standards, protecting animal welfare, protecting our health services, uh, making our medicines safe, and on and on and on. All the regulations that you know, we all, we all um, campaign for and try and promote. The idea that these should just be kind of um, traded away uh, in, a, in an international trade negotiation uh, is, is, is really quite obscene. And I think people in Europe particularly saw this with TTIP, where we all came to understand uh, what chlorine chickens were, this way that Americans produce um, chickens with um, a chlorine type uh, wash, which basically means the chickens can be kept in really atrocious uh, conditions. Um, but under a trade deal between the European Union and the United States, the idea was that you, you, you effectively say, well, you're, you're more or less producing to our standard. So those chickens can be imported for the first time into European markets. And of course, what effect will that have, even if the trade agreement itself does not say we are allowed in Europe to produce chickens this way, over time our farmers have no choice but to say I must be able to produce to a lower standard or I can't compete with these imports. And in that way, you create this kind of race to the bottom. Now, chlorine chickens is just one example. There's so many different regulations that can be affected by trade deals. And I think the fact for us as Democrats um, that you can do all of this behind closed doors in a secret negotiation and inflict it on society without a democratic debate is particularly pernicious. And I think one of the reasons that we managed to, in the end, kick out uh, 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 TTIP. Second example, intellectual property. I've been working for the last two and a half years on... COVID vaccines. COVID vaccines were very unequally distributed around the world. While we in Europe were getting our third or fourth doses, many countries didn't even have enough for the first dose for their health workers, never mind anyone else. Terrible inequality. And at the heart of that inequality was not just that rich countries were hoarding vaccines, they were, but there was another problem, which is that we weren't producing enough for everybody in the world. And we weren't producing enough because the knowledge, the recipes, the, in, the right to produce, the intellectual property behind those medicines was in the hands of five corporations. Right, so the head of Pfizer, the head of Moderna, were able to decide who produces, how many are produced, who gets to buy, and at what price. Corporate executives get to make those decisions in the middle of a pandemic. And that's because of a so-called trade agreement called TRIPS, passed in the mid-90s at the World Trade Organization at the urging of pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer, no surprise, which said everywhere in the world needs to accept US-style intellectual property uh, provision, which is like 20 years minimum um, applies to um, my right to have a monopoly over this technology. 
Now, this massively changed the way trade works because for developing world countries, right, the, the, the main benefit of trade was often, I get to see what you've made and copy it. Right? Essentially, that's how China developed. That's how Korea developed. That's how any, to be honest, that's how Britain developed. It's how America developed. It's how all of our countries have developed. No one's developed in any other way. So the idea that you stop them doing that, you prevent that kind of technology transfer and turn those countries into renters, essentially, of your technology, massively changes power dynamics in the world. It massively shifts power to the rich and to the north and allows them to hoard monopolies and it promotes monopoly capitalism. And so in the pandemic, you saw that we have these companies that own the right to produce vaccines, even though they not created them in the first place, they just owned the intellectual property for various reasons, meant they could hoard knowledge and artificially constrain supply. Now, that doesn't sound like a trade rule, but it is a trade rule um, in the global economy. Um, and that problem for COVID vaccines is going to be a problem for climate technologies. It's going to be a problem for um, IT um, how we take on the power of big tech is right at the core of monopoly capitalism. So third thing, third and final thing I want to I want to talk about is investment. So investment is really important. It's often overlooked, but investment chapters, investment agreements, um, are really about giving money itself or capital protection and freedom to do what it wants, especially protection from government regulation and control. And actually. Globalization was always far more about the freedom of capital than it was increasing trade flows. This was much more important to the globalization project. It's also extremely colonial in its origins. So it's one of the ways that the old imperial powers here in Europe and uh, the United States, of course, maintained control over the world after the Second World War because it was often our countries who had the corporations and elites that were investing or exploiting, if you want to look at it in a different way, um, other parts of the world, and they wanted to make sure that investment was protected against governments that were bound to come to power and say, hang on a minute, that's our resource. Why are you just allowed to take that? We want to nationalize it, or we want to regulate the way you're allowed to work in our economy. And I think the thing that best demonstrates it, I'm not going to talk about it a lot because um, Lucia is going to talk about it more, is, is at the heart of invest a lot of investment agreements, this thing called ISDS this corporate court system, which offers legal protection. It's a, it's a parallel legal system, which is only open to big business and big investors from abroad. An arbitration system which carries the weight of international law and which a, trans, a foreign transnational corporation can take a legal case if they believe they've been treated unfairly. And being treated unfairly is a very wide definition, as we're going to, as we're going to hear. It was actually invented by uh, fossil fuel and financial corporate executives back in the 50s, and they were quite explicit. You know, we've got all these newly um, uh, uh, new countries emerging from colonialism. How are we going to protect what we've been extracting through imperialism when those countries are free? You know, okay, my government said, yeah, we can send in the gunboats and we can overthrow governments like we did in Iran, the democratically elected government of Iran in the 50s, but, you know, ultimately it's quite expensive and it's quite, you know, there is a political cost to that. Far better that we create a legal system which simply allows us to do it, to hand that power over um, to corporations. And so you see, uh, Lucia is going to give some examples of how this works, but um, climate examples, but it isn't just climate change. So the government of Australia was sued by Philip Morris Tobacco, makes Marlboro cigarettes, for daring to put cigarettes in plain packaging as a, as a health measure. And Philip Morris said, well, that's not fair. We expected to make a certain amount of money when we came to Australia. How can we do that? If, and they sued them. You know? And Slovenia nationalized its health insurance system. South Africa tried to promote black economic empowerment post-apartheid. Canada refused to give a pharmaceutical company an extension of its monopoly. All led to ISDS cases. And even if the firms don't win, obviously this has a chilling effect on what they're likely to do. So look, I'm going to end. Um, by, by just saying, I think uh, this is all very uh, grim. Um, I actually think we are in an interesting time now where the political support for this kind of system is waning in our own societies. And even people in the establishment are beginning to look and say, is this a good idea? The example I like to give, you remember the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal because it was too big to go through the canal, right? 
because we've made ships so big. Our just-in-time supply chains are utter dependence upon these ridiculously long supply chains where we can push costs and push regulation down as much as possible means that we literally don't have the ability to get stuff across the world fast enough. So we've made ships too big to go through the canals they need to go through. So a ship gets stuck for several weeks and global trade comes to a halt. Right? This is crazy. This is unsustainable. This is the system eating itself. And I think that's the reason why you begin to see, even in the United States now, an administration that isn't very interested in signing new trade deals. Right, that's a big turning point. Uh, my own government is interested in signing trade deals, uh, and I think that says something because, as you will know, they are an extremely liberalizing, deregulating government, and they see it as a way of doing that. But more generally, I think there is a big backlash against it, and I think that's an important um, moment for us to say, yes, we need it to be different. But as internationalists, we don't believe in simply pulling up the drawbridge and saying we don't want anything to do with the rest of the world. We make everything ourselves. Um, we need to find a different form of trading system, which is fairer, which creates, uh, which creates equality, um, and which helps us deal with the terrible climate crisis that we're in. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, yeah, now you already talked about uh, ISDS and how it um, hinders our governments from taking the action it should take. Uh, Lucia, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how uh, this is plays out in the field of climate, in particular with the so-called Energy Charter Treaty? Yeah, this is, yeah okay. Yeah, um, so indeed I'm going to talk uh, a bit more into detail into one specific agreement which is the Energy Charter Treaty. I don't know if any of you have heard of this or it sounds a bit familiar. I see some hands that are saying yes. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the name of the forum is trade, but trade is so big that it's about like very many, many, many things as Nick was saying, but in TNI, in my institute, we have specialized a bit more into ISDS, which is everything that has to do with investment protection. And in fact, I can say that I think this has given us um, the good opportunity to, to emphasize in one specific mechanism that corporations use in this free trade agreement to show the, the horrors of the system. No? So it has, it has been very helpful and very useful to, you know, to concentrate into this specific mechanisms, although trade is much, much broader than what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so the Energy Charter Treaty is, in fact, not a new agreement. It's actually an agreement that was designed in the 90s and signed in the 1991. Um, some countries joined in a bit later, so I will steal the drawing of Luciana. <laughs> But you see in that ladder, it would fit into the first level of the ladder, no? So it was signed in the 90s when it was like a moment of proliferation of bilateral investment treaties. After the failure of the WTO agreement, uh, there was a new um, strategy to, so we failed in the WTO, but we still need these agreements to, you know, be able to um, make a free market for our corporations to invest in a safe <laughs> spaces for them. So then they started to... Uh, design and create many, 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 many bilateral investment agreements. But in the 90s, there was an explosion of agreements. And not only bilateral investment treaties, which is between two countries, but also multi-party or multilateral agreements. The first one being NAFTA, um, which is the one between the USA, Canada, and Mexico. But then the ACT was also designed in that moment, uh, which was signed, uh, well, now it has like 53 uh, member parties. So it's actually one of the biggest um, multilateral agreement. And the specificity of this treaty is that it's um, energy specific related. So it really is the only agreement that um, talks uh, about yeah, how to do design rules um, on energy specific investments. No, and we're gonna go a bit more into detail later what that means. Um, so as I said, yeah, it's uh, the only agreement, multilateral agreement on energy. And yes, it, it was designed in the 90s when it was a moment of the fall of the Berlin Wall. No, so the the former Soviet countries uh, were now in the like it, it was not the same blocks anymore. So the EU had to somehow make sure that their investments were still going to be safe in these countries and that they would also uh, have like um, flow of um, gas and and carbon and everything coming from from ex former Soviet countries. So that was a bit like the motive of doing this, 
But in fact, who was in the negotiation tables were not only politicians, but they're also um, like energy companies, and especially European companies, so Shell, Exxon, were part of the negotiations of the, of the content of the treaty. So of course, what they were looking for was to design a contract, a private contract that countries would join, and that had a lot of benefits for them. Um, so it was really, you can say it's a treaty designed for and by um, big energy corporations and transnational corporations specifically. No? So 30 years later, after the, the signing of the agreement, we start seeing um, the first cases of ISDS. And this is a bit how we got to work into the, into the ECT, because we have been following ISDS in different agreements and in different cases, but then we started seeing like there was like um, many, many, many cases coming in only from one specific agreement. And many of these cases were related to, um, were initiated by fossil fuel companies, no? So then we started to look uh, a bit more into depth and what is this agreement and, you know, like why did we sign this agreement and why have we never heard about this agreement before? So 30 years later, we come to realize that this is one of the most obsolete treaties, like all these old um, treaties that we actually have today, which is actually in contradiction right now with the newest um, law investment reforms by the EU. So the new agreements cannot contain things that this agreement has. No, um, and not only that, but you know, like it was a, an agreement which was sponsored by the EU very much. No, like a EU specific agreement, but. Now we see that there's like a boomerang effect because the treaty is now, um, you know, like many of these lawsuits are coming from European countries against other European countries, no? So this is like something that I'm sure that when they signed this agreement, they didn't expect this effect to happen. But this can happen because the rules are so broad and so vague that nobody can predict what can actually happen when you sign this type of agreement, right? So it's like, as I said, it's like a, like a private uh, contract that you have no? with, uh, between the different countries with the difference that you cannot renegotiate anything that's in the contract. But once you sign it, you are like giving like a free check to whichever investor or investment comes from any of these 53 uh, parties that are part of the agreement. No? So imagine like instead of you negotiating like a like in a bilateral way with a, with a country and saying like, okay, I, I will allow investments to come from your country, but only in these conditions. So you cannot put any condition anymore because you have actually signed away everything, no? Um, so so, the, so this uh, treaty has many rules to protect investments. Of course, it has no obligations for fossil fuel investors. It only has rights, as they call it, but it's basically privileges that gives uh, um, fossil fuel investors. And the way to enforce these rules is precisely what Nick was saying um, by using these um, private tribunals, so ISDS. So ISDS comes from um, Investment State Dispute Settlement, which is like a, a way to, to solve uh, possible conflicts that arise between an investor and a country. And this comes from private law, like from commercial law, which is used a lot between like when there's like a conflict between two companies then instead of going to national judges and opening like a process in the public um, system like national domestic tribunals they decide to go in this private uh, way of solving um, the conflict but you can say that's okay if it's about two companies because they're using their money like it's two private companies solving however they want their issues but then they they kind of like export that idea um, for state and investors so then it's like using the same system, but not only between private companies, but between a state, so that's all of our money, uh, and a private company. And not only all, all of our money, because the way to compensate the company is always monetary, but not only it's our money, but it's also getting more and more into public interest issues. So you see like when you, like already the name, no? Like already saying that an investor and a state are like at the same level, it's already a bit strange, no? Like in, if you study law, no? Like why, why is that? So, so anyway, yeah, so the investor is the only one that's allowed to initiate um, a case and the state can only defend itself. And in most cases we have been investigating uh, since a long time in TNI, we come to realize that these type of tribunals are completely biased. 
because they are there to defend the investor's protection. So they usually don't take into account other issues, like for example, um, environmental issues or public health issues. So they're really there to defend the, the investor. So in more than half of the cases worldwide, the results of this, I think it's 70%, I don't know, but a lot of percentage, the result is in favor of the investor. So it's already a system that has been, it, it, it is receiving a lot of criticisms, as Nick was also saying, in particular, since we also initiated like campaigns like TTIP, one of the big issues in TTIP was precisely that it had this system incorporated. And the, the, the European Court of Justice even recognized that this system was anti-constitutional. It was like against European law, because how could there be a system that goes, you know, like it, over, it overlaps? No, yeah, it goes above national law. Like investors don't have to first go to national courts. They can go directly to this system. So you have all these issues, no? Like they can go directly to this um, system. The, usually the arbitrators who are the, law, the judges who decide are completely biased in favor of the investor. And it's completely unpredictable because it's case by case law. So you have no idea what kind of jurisdiction they're using. It's exit uh, rules and it's very hard to know what the interpretation is going to be by the, by the arbitrators. So you have like, yeah, like this system which Right now, it makes no sense. And I mean, this is of course debatable, but this system was invented in the 60s, no? When there was like a decolonization of many countries and of course, Western capital said, oh yes, they can decolonize, but we have to make sure that our investments are going to be protected. So they invented this system to make sure that their investments would always be protected. But then that logic is now applying also to European um, countries and, and, and everything, no? So in the way, and when we, sorry, I'm, already late but when we dispute these topics you always get like a reply of like saying from investors like they say yeah but we need to have a, a system that protects our investments so then it's like what so is our national tribunals not fair enough for for you that you have to use like a special treatment in this investment court so anyway so this system has been disputed and criticized by academics lawyers etc but the system is still in the Energy Charter Treaty, and even though the treaty has been undergoing a renegotiation or a modernization, this system has not been touched at all. So the final uh, version of the new text of the ECD still keeps um, ISDS. So, so that's, a, uh, that's a big problem. And anyway, so right now, the Energy Charter Treaty is an is a investment treaty that has most ISDS cases only through this one treaty, so it's 143 cases to now, and most of them are related to decarbonization policies. And that's what we're seeing now with a very wor worrisome eye, right? Um, and, but there could be many more cases because a recent study by Investigate um, Europe, which is like an ind independent journalist group, they discovered that, I mean, they discovered, they put some numbers out saying that only in Europe there are around 345 billion euros of in fossil fuel infrastructure that are protected under the Energy Charter Treaty. So that means that we could potentially face uh, billions and billions of million, um, yeah, like new lawsuits if we continue to be inside this agreement. And one of the cases, just to give you an example of what cases we're talking about, um, is um, Uniper and RWE, which are German companies, that um, sued the Netherlands because the Netherlands passed um, a law that said that they would um, stop using um, electricity that comes from, yeah, like they would start decarbonizing their electricity system in 2030. So then RWE and Uniper said that that regulation was going against their private investments because they would not have as much benefits as they, as they would have if that regulation was not there, no? So they sued um, the Netherlands. Although, I don't know if you've heard this news, but Uniper, which was bailed out by the German government, put uh, as one part of the, of the conditions that they would have to drop the case, no? But that's like an anecdotal example that happened, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna happen in all the other cases. There's another case by Rockhopper, which is a British, a British uh, company that sued Italy after Italy uh, retired the license of exploration, like mining exploration in the sea, in the Adriatic Sea. So what I want to raise here, the point is that 
we're going to be seeing more and more of these cases, the more regulations there are going to be that are going to go against fossil fuel um, usage, no? or, or companies or investors, which is where we have to go as, you know, as if we want to keep the 1.5 uh, degrees. So there's going to be a clash and conflict um, on like climate friendly policies and investment agreements. Um, and the Energy Charger Treaty is going to be the, the harshest one, especially for European countries because they're the ones that are being more sued um, up to now. So as I said, and I'm going to finish with this, the ECT uh, went through a modernization process because of course they realized that they couldn't keep this agreement as it was 30 years ago. Like we've been having so many advancements in so many other agreements, but the ECT hasn't changed a comma. So they decided to open a process and to renegotiate and modernize parts of the treaty. Um, and we just uh, had, there's some campaigners here that can <laughs> explain more, but we just had like the text in August. So this August, so we're still in August. <laughs> So like basically some weeks ago we had like the final text of the modernized treaty and we already knew that it wasn't going to be the best um, outcome because ISS was still there but uh, the EU they decided to include like a clause that said we will you know slowly start stop protecting fossil fuel investments in the ECT only for those countries that decide to do so so it's not an obligation it's a flexible proposal and it will start in 10 years, so 10 more years of protecting fossil fuels. And this is something that the members decided by themselves. Nobody told them it had to be 10 years. So again, yeah, like is it enough like to keep protecting fossil fuels for 10 years? We know that it's not good timing because of the climate urgency. So, so yeah, so as we as campaigners, we are definitely saying that the modernized text is still bad as it was before. Uh, but the good news is that we're still in time to stop this agreement. <laughs> so, so yeah, the modernization text is out, but it hasn't been signed yet. It has to be uh, first like approved in the EU Council, and the member countries have to approve, um, sign the modernized text. And there are already countries that have said that they will not um, approve the text, they have said it, we don't know if it's going to be real or not, but for example, Spain, which is where I'm from, um, the Minister of Transi Ecological Transition said that the ECT is very bad for the climate, it's going to protect fossil fuels, and that she's not going to sign the agreement. Um, the German government, um, in its new poli trade policy, included some requisites also about the modernized ECT, and they expressed that they would also you know, think about not signing the agreement. And the Netherlands also approved a motion in the parliament saying that they would also not sign the modernized agreement. So yes, there is hope. And this, I have to say, that has only been possible because we, social movements and trade unions, um, civil organizations, think tanks, have been able to make all this information public. That's, remember, like, uh, Susan George used to tell this story, like, to kill the TTIP, you, you had to be like a vampire, no? Like when you shed light to it, then it would die, no? And that's a bit like how these negotiations go because they're all so secretly that nobody knows anything about them. So it's when we start campaigning and showing the horrors about it is that people start rethinking and also politicians because most of the times they have no idea what they're doing. Um, and yeah, so anyway, ECT is only one of 3000 BITs. So Luciana will talk to us a bit more about other agreements. Um, and yeah, that's my time. Thank you. You've got your own microphone, and yeah, now Luciana will tell us a bit more hello, about, hello. in particular, the North-South relations, the relations between the EU and South America, and yeah, how okay. they are problematic. Okay, this is working, yes, okay. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our trade forum. Uh, it's interesting. I was I was looking at. I will start somewhere else first. Um, then I will go to that point. Um, I was thinking that it's good that you're here. I'm happy you're here, but it's like it's very few of us, right, for the trade forum. And I was thinking that it's interesting that uh, we keep putting the trade issues as trade issues. Nick already started with that, saying 
trade is not about trade, actually. So we're, what are we talking about now? That all the things that go beyond the borders of the state and that uh, corporations are very eager to guarantee in all these agreements because they guarantee their gain. So this is trade about. So it should be many more of us discussing trade because trade has to do with every day, and that's why we put on the, on the, on the blackboard, like, like in school, um, it's a very small diagram to show how these trade agreements have been evol evolving these past 25 years. How? Uh, Lucia talked about the ECT, so the Energy Charter Treaty. Uh, we can do that? Oh, that's good. Okay, I like this. Um, Lucia talked about the Energy Charter Treaty. We place at the same moment the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. We place the BITS, the Bilateral Investment Treaties, and the ECT in the 90s. So that is like, the, like what, what United States said at that time. Well, we're generating the new law for all the globe, right? With this, after, after uh, the, the end of the Soviet Union, now this is how international trade would look like. We will have the WTO here also in the first step, but it's not an agreement, it's much more than that. So we have that. Then we have like a second step. The ALCA, the Free Trade Area of the Americas, FTAA, was a second stage, why? Because if we compare the text, yes, yeah, some nerds like us do that. We actually read the text, we have to read the text. So when we read the text, we see how they start getting more complex and, and, and start including more uh, different issues that they were not in NAFTA. Uh, and then when we see the third stage, we're already like past 2010, we have the Trans-Pacific Partnership and we have the TTIP that you know so much about. I know more of the TPP because some of Latin American countries are inside that Trans-Pacific Partnership. The UK will soon be in the Trans-Pacific Partnership too. Well, this is very strange. I didn't, I didn't think, I thought I had studied geography and I didn't see the UK on the Pacific, but who knows? Maybe it just moved. It could be it's an island after all. Uh, who knows? Uh, so why? What do we have in the TPP and the TTIP besides too many P's and T's? What we have in this third stage is more complex, especially these disciplines that are related to what states can do bureaucratically, administratively, and also what laws can these states pass. So we're looking at these, these instruments have become a very powerful octopus that cover all of the issues related to corporate agenda. So they want to have everything there. In the TPP and the TTIP, we found these chapters of 25, 30 pages of regulatory coherence, the regulatory issues. So states can't uh, move as they moved before. These uh, agreements have become locks, yes? They have become locks to state action. They have, been, they have become locks to privatization processes. So imagine if we are talking about these agreements having 30 chapters, for example, the TPP has 30 chapters. Of the 30 chapters, only five chapters are trade-related issues. Only five chapters. So what about the, uh, the other 25 chapters? Well, we have investment, we have, we have services, we have financial services, we have e-commerce, we have property, intellectual property rights, we have investment, and we have regulatory coherence, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah? So we have a lot of chapters that have to do with what states can actually do. This is trade, and that is why I'm so worried that it's just us. We should be able, as activists, to explain this in a way. I think we do, but people keep thinking that trade is something for, for uh, economists or for lawyers, and we try to explain the overall impacts of these treaties. And that's when I want to go to my second point, which is how do we analyze these impacts? First, if we see at NAFTA time, yeah, we go to NAFTA time, 1993, they were negotiating, 1994, it started working, so it, it, it entered into force. January the 1st, 1994, the day the Zapatistas went out of the, of the, of the jungle and said, Shabasta. They were talking to that also, huh? They were resisting already to that. But if we see 
the text and we see the activists in Mexico, in Canada, in the US, they didn't really know what would happen, right? Because the text was there, they could imagine the impacts, but we still didn't know, this was new. But now we have almost 30 years, we have plus 25 years of impacts that we can analyze. So we should be analyzing the, those impacts. We have been doing that in Latin America. We, are, we have been doing that and we still have a long way to go for you to know. We are still trying to gather more brains to analyze this because we need the technical knowledge in order to analyze economical impacts, in order to analyze how laws have changed because of the FTAs. And also you can say, well, but why did the, the countries sign these agreements? I mean, didn't they know? Were they traitors? Were they selling the country? What were they doing? What were they thinking about? Well, in the case of Latin America, uh, there were mainly two things that I can bring as two possible explanations. One is that Latin American countries were, and still are, like Argentina itself, in big debt crisis. So if we see how the negotiations of the bilateral investment treaties were done in 1991, 1992, 93, 94, for example, when massively all Latin American countries entered into the, into the um, investment treaties, there was a lot of pressure from, from for example, we have that uh, in documents from the pressure from the German government, for example, to pay the debt Argentina had in, at that moment, 1991, with uh, some of the hedge funds like Hermes, the, the group Hermes, uh, in Germany. So we see that there is a connection, a very strong connection between the debt crisis in Latin America and the signing of these bids. But also a second point, there were a lot of promises made associated with that. What still strikes me is that we see today the, negotiator, the negotiators, negotiators doing exactly the same promises that they did 30 years ago and people buy it. I mean, people in general, but also like small and medium enterprises. I mean, you should know exactly how it has impacted in Colombia, how this has impacted in Peru, in Chile how the trade agreements have impacted indus industrial uh, mechanisms in each country, so you can know the impacts on your own country too. Um, some of these promises, what were the promises, for example? Increase of employment. So we had Salinas de Gortari, the president of Mexico, signing the NAFTA, and he said this phrase. He said, with this agreement, my fellow Mexicans won't have to migrate to the US anymore. I'm quoting 1993. Yeah, we, we saw that, right? We saw that happen with NAFTA. Yeah, NAFTA made magic there. We have seen actually all of Central America entering the FTAs with the United States, and we still see the big migration wave going up, and how CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, and NAFTA itself have disarmed industrial situations in Central America, and they have become especially exporters of uh, raw materials. And that's the second point. The second promise was, if you sign the trade agreements, you will have export di diversification. So you will be able to export other products uh, than the ones that you do today. When we see what happened after, for example, the Chile EU, the Mexico EU, if we see after the Colombia or Peru EU with the US also, we see that actually the opposite happened. What we see is that what has been enhanced is the export of raw materials. So if you see the whole of Latin America with trade agreements, you see that what countries export are th the main products of export to the EU, for example, are the products that are in the sea. So you have shrimps, fish, salmon, in, in the case of Chile, for example, tuna, canned tuna, canned fish, then you have the progress of the jungle, the fruits, the coffee, the cacao, no? Co cocoa it would be. Uh, then you have uh, flowers, then you have uh, also in the soil we have minerals, we have uh, lithium now, we have gold, we have oil of course and gas. Colombia exports oil and gas to the, the European Union. Uh, and also we have uh, the products of the fields, soy, uh, meat, yeah? So these are the, if you see every Latin American country, you will see these are the products that Latin American countries export to the EU, for example. 
And what does the EU export to countries in the region, in Latin America? They export planes, vessels, motors, cars, motor cars, uh, helicopters, vaccines, medicines, antibiotics, uh, chemicals in general. So what we see is like there is like a very little imbalance there, right? In the trade uh, equi equilibrium between the two, the two regions. This is a big problem because it's something that we have seen, and, and I'm going to finish with this, but what we're seeing is that actually the free trade agreements for the, the whole of the, of the global south, I'm bringing of course the, the case of Latin America, which is what I know of better, but uh, what we see is that the free trade agreements have enhanced or have deepened extractivism in the south. And one of the tendencies that we are seeing now is that in in uh, this way of having the energy transition in Europe, the new agreements or the old agreements made new, like the modernization with Chile and, and Mexico, what we see is that what they, what they are actually doing is that they guarantee access for corporations in Europe to lithium, for example, or nickel, or all the products associated with the fabrication of the batteries for electric cars. And that is called, in Europe, energy transition, which is super. But the thing is that the European Union is using the trade mechanism. So this is what we see. The European Union is using the trade mechanism to guarantee access to Volkswagen, to Mercedes-Benz, for example, access to the lithium they need for the energy transition. What does this bring? Well, it brings that all the consequences are being left there in these sacrifice zones, for example, in the Andes. And so, can we talk about, and th this is a question, I think I have the answer, but this is a question we have to make. Can we talk about a new Green Deal? Can we talk about energy transition with free trade agreements? I think not. That's why the trade agenda is much more than trade, and we should be discussing this when we discuss transitions to a post-capitalist uh, um, society because there are no real changes with these free trade agreements that have come to actually change our possibilities to change policies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luciana. And now, Thomas, uh, please tell us what, what's at stake with CETA at the moment and why is it so important still? Ich glaube, nur in den Mund halten, dann probier mal. Hallo, hallo. Ja, ja ich mache es in Deutsch. Äh, hallo zusammen. Äh, vielen Dank auch für die bisherigen Vorträge. Es war im Grunde, ähm, also ich bin froh, dass, dass das hier so betont wurde, ähm, dass es äh, in der Handelspolitik natürlich um viel mehr als um Handel geht. Ähm, Im Grunde waren es tolle Vorträge über das, was wir in der äh, AG Welthandel und WTO bei Attac hier in Deutschland, womit wir uns beschäftigen. Ähm, ich bin seit ähm, sechs Jahren dabei, aber die, ähm, die AG ist im Grunde direkt nach der Gründung von Attac Deutschland gegründet worden. Damals ging es ja um, um die WTO, um äh, GATS. Äh, deswegen, ich würde also auch noch, Nick, äh, bei der, du hast drei Aspekte genannt, ähm, Regulation, ähm, äh, ähm, intellektuelle Rechte und ähm, Investitionsschutz. Ich würde auf jeden Fall auch noch die Dienstleistungen mit hinzunehmen. <lacht> Vielleicht hast du deswegen nicht mehr darüber gesprochen, weil das im Grunde schon erledigt ist, ja, weil vieles schon äh, privatisiert wurde und dem Markt geöffnet wurde. Ähm, ja, jedenfalls ähm, vor, ja, vor sechs, sieben Jahren ging das ja dann los mit TTIP. Wir haben dann also uns natürlich äh, schwerpunktmäßig auch darum gekümmert. Ich bin, wie gesagt, damals dann ähm, auch dazugekommen und ähm, seitdem dann das Europäische Parlament zugestimmt hatte, das war Anfang 2017 und äh, Trump ja ungefähr gleichzeitig an die, Regier an die, an die Präsidentschaft kam, ja, da hieß es dann, ähm, äh, also Trump hat sich ja auch so ein bisschen rhetorisch gegen den Freihandel gewandt, hat ja da auch NAFTA neu verhandelt und was ja immerhin bemerkenswert ist, dass ja in dem neuen, also in dem Nachfolgeabkommen von, von NAFTA ja der Investitionsschutz in der Tat nicht mehr drin ist. Ähm, äh, jedenfalls damals hieß es ja, ihr seid ja Parteigänger von Trump, wenn ihr euch gegen TTIP und CETA wendet, 
ähm, und ähm, die Luft war so ein bisschen raus. Es hat die Öffentlichkeit einfach nicht mehr so richtig interessiert. Auch die, die Journalisten haben praktisch dicht gemacht und man hat die ganze Zeit gewartet, bis das Bundesverfassungsgericht über die, ähm, ich glaube, es waren fünf oder sechs äh, CETA-Verfassungsbeschwerden ähm, entscheidet, die eben damals 2016 eingereicht worden sind. Also man hat auch viel früher mit der Entscheidung gerechnet. Ähm, sie ist dann jetzt erst im, im Februar oder März diesen Jahres gekommen. Ähm, ja, also so lange hat das Thema praktisch geschlafen und auch die Politik hat gesagt, gut, wir warten das jetzt erstmal ab. Also ich meine jetzt die, die deutsche Politik, ähm, denn CETA ist ja ein, ähm, ein gemischtes EU-Freihandelsabkommen, wo auch die Parlamente der national der, der EU-Mitgliedstaaten ähm, an der Regierung, an, an der Ratifizierung äh, teilnehmen. Ähm, bei den Nachfolgeabkommen hat man das ja dann anders gemacht. Die hat man dann als reine Handelsabkommen deklariert, um sie praktisch ohne die nationalen Parlamente äh, beschließen zu können. So jedenfalls war jetzt also das ähm, Urteil des Bundesverfassungsgerichts äh, der Startschuss dafür, dass CETA jetzt hier wieder in Deutschland auf die Agenda kam und die CDU hat, glaube ich, sechs, sechs Mal, hat also, ja, da muss dann so ein Zustimmungsgesetz formuliert werden, das wird dann ins Parlament eingebracht und die CDU hat also eins formuliert und hat das, glaube ich, sechs Mal inzwischen schon in den Bundestag eingebracht und die Grünen, die jetzt in der Regierung sind, wir haben ja jetzt seit Herbst eine sozialdemokratische Grüne und äh, liberale äh, Regierung, ähm, äh, also eine Koalition. Ähm, also die Grünen meinten dann irgendwann so, wir bringen das jetzt mal äh, von uns aus auch in den Bundestag ein, ähm, um praktisch den Stier bei den Hörnern zu packen. Und ähm, wir wollen aber noch was erreichen. Wir wollen diesen Investitionsschutz, worüber äh, Lucia und äh, ja vor allem Lucia ähm, geredet hat. Wir wollen den entschärfen, also der ist in CETA sowieso schon ein bisschen entschärft, das ist allerdings mehr Kosmetik als wirklich eine substanzielle Änderung. Aber die Grünen haben nun gesagt, wir werden also am Ende nur zustimmen, wenn Erklärungen verabschiedet werden, die den diesen Investitionsschutz entschärfen. Also die, die Formulierung ist, er soll nicht missbraucht werden können. Also diese, äh, diese, äh, dieses Verbot, der, äh, dass, dass Investoren nicht fair behandelt werden und so, äh, ja, das, das ist ja das Problem, dass man das eben sehr weit auslegen kann. Da sollen also jetzt Erklärungen gefunden werden, die das äh, entschärfen, sodass das enger gefasst wird. Also das ist alles sehr vage. Jedenfalls haben die Grünen äh, gesagt, sie werden also nur zustimmen, wenn es diese Erklärungen gibt. Und ähm, äh, wenn es die nach Meinung der Grünen zufriedenstellend gibt, soll dann aber nach der Sommerpause äh, die, zweite, sollen die zweite und dritte Lesung erfolgen. Das heißt, CETA soll dann im Bundestag äh, beschlossen werden. Dann wäre also Deutschland ein Land mehr, was CETA ratifiziert hat. Es fehlen noch eine Reihe anderer Länder. Ähm, zum Beispiel Belgien oder Italien oder Frankreich. Ähm, äh, also das heißt, CETA wäre damit nicht endgültig ratifiziert. Aber für uns hier ist es jetzt also äh, der Startschuss, um uns dann noch mal äh, vermehrt gegen zu wenden. Ähm, äh, so, das war im Grunde jetzt die, die Herleitung, warum es also hier wieder aktuell ist. Was, was uns jetzt wichtig ist oder was wir denken, ähm, ähm, ist, dass man, wir haben ja eben, also das ist ja im Grunde jetzt Zufall, dass das, dass das zusammentrifft oder vielleicht ist auch kein Zufall, aber jedenfalls, wir haben jetzt hier diese Lage durch den Angriffskrieg der äh, Russlands gegen die Ukraine und diese ganze, ich weiß nicht, ob man das, ich nehme an, das kriegt man im Rest Europas auch mit, also äh, äh, Putin dreht ja jetzt immer mehr den, den Gashahn zu oder jedenfalls ähm, äh, müssen wir uns hier fragen und es wird unsicher ähm, ob wir im Winter genug Gas haben, um äh, unsere Wohnung zu heizen zum Beispiel. Also ich habe auch eine Gasheizung zu Hause. Äh, ich habe mir schon überlegt, dass ich zur Not irgendwie äh, in der Küche aufhalte oder so. Ja? Also jedenfalls ähm, ist das äh, die derzeitige Lage und natürlich ähm, äh, auch die, die politische Situation, dass man eben äh, Russland äh, 
natürlich da Einhalt gebieten will. Und in dieser Situation ist das Argument jetzt, und ich denke auch so die Sichtweise vieler, Mensch, lass mich in Ruhe mit den ganzen Problemen, die es bei CETA gibt. Wir müssen jetzt mit den Kanadiern hier zusammenarbeiten. Das sind doch unsere guten Freunde und die sind doch also tadellos demokratisch. Und also wenn wir mit denen jetzt nicht kooperieren können, mit wem dann sonst? Ja, also unser, unser grüner Wirtschaftsminister ist ja sogar nach Katar gefahren und hat da also Verträge abgeschlossen zur Lieferung von Gas. Und dann muss das also mit, mit Kanada doch äh, erst recht gehen. Ähm, wie gesagt, ich denke, ähm, das, das ist äh, aktuell die, praktisch die Diskurslage. Und ähm, ich weiß nun zufällig, oder ja, also ich weiß nicht, ob jemand die, äh, also ich wusste nun zufällig, es gibt diese, diese Umweltorganisation hier in Deutschland, Urgewalt nennen die sich, die haben sich einen Namen gemacht damit, dass sie aufzeigen, welche, welche Unternehmen wie in fossile Energien investieren, damit jene Anleger, die dann also sich nachhaltig ausrichten wollen, ihre Finger von diesen Investitionen, diesen Unternehmen lassen. Ja, das ist die Idee der fossilen Energie, praktisch einfach die Finanzierungsgrundlage zu entziehen. Also ich finde, die machen da eine sehr gute Arbeit. Jedenfalls wusste ich nun zufällig, dass die im Rahmen dieses Projektes, was sie da haben, auch eine Liste haben von 25 Projekten weltweit, die also besonders, ja, besonders skandalös sind, weil entweder der Klima, das Klima besonders geschädigt wird oder die, die Rechte der, der Indigenen besonders verletzt werden. Also so verschiedene Kategorien, ja. Und äh, von diesen 25 Projekten weltweit liegen also fünf in Kanada. Also damit ist Kanada absolut äh, Spitzenreiter in der Welt. Ähm, ein sechstes Projekt liegt noch in den USA und dient auch dem Trans also einem Pipeline-Projekt, was auch dem Transport kanadischen Öls oder Gases dient. Ähm, ähm, Deswegen, ich denke, was man derzeit machen sollte, ist wirklich auf diesen Widerspruch hinzuweisen, also einmal dieses Narrativ so ein bisschen zu erschüttern, dass, dass Kanada so ein wahnsinnig unproblematischer Partner wäre, zumal auch bei allen diesen Projekten die Rechte der Indigenen also regelmäßig einfach links liegen gelassen werden. Ähm, und ähm, äh, das eine ist eben, äh, ob man kurzfristig Krisenpolitik betreibt. Ähm, das ähm, kann man sicherlich verstehen, dass man das in der jetzigen Situation macht, weil es wirklich unsicher ist, wo, wo das Gas äh, eventuell herkommt im, im Winter. Ähm, aber ähm, ähm, Krisenpolitik ist eben das eine, und langfristige Rechtssicherheit, die durch solche Handelsverträge geschaffen wird, ist eben was ganz anderes. Das eine ist eben dieser Investitionsschutz, von dem wir gehört haben. Ja, da ist es ganz klar, das ist über Jahrzehnte hinaus, weil es ja auch diese Klauseln gibt, dass das dann noch 20 Jahre weiter, weiter in Kraft bleibt, wenn man das kündigt und so weiter. Also da wird über Jahrzehnte hinaus werden diese Investitionen abgesichert und ähm, es geht aber auch schon im Grunde los. Ähm, äh, Im Moment ähm, wird, wird CETA ja schon vorläufig angewendet, das heißt, es ist eigentlich schon in Kraft bis auf eben vor allem diesen Investitionsschutz ähm, und ähm, auch die normalen Liberalisierungsverpflichtungen, ja, dass man eben ähm, die, 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 die Waren einfach eben äh, reinlassen muss, auch die hindern natürlich die Politik schon daran, ähm, zu sagen, naja, äh, okay, jetzt haben wir den Winter überstanden und jetzt wollen wir vielleicht das kanadische Teersandöl doch nicht mehr haben. Also allein dieses kanadische Teersandöl, wo einige sicherlich schon mal von gehört haben, das ist also eine Fläche größer als äh, England. Da stand eigentlich Urwald und zwar ist das so ein besonderer Urwald, weil das ja also nördliche Breiten sind. Dieser Urwald hat äh, doppelt so viel CO2 gespeichert, wie das der tropische Regenwald tut. 
Und ähm, ja, wie gesagt, eine Fläche größer als England. Und um also an dieses Öl zu kommen, was praktisch, ja, was in diesem Teersand steckt, ja, der Teersand liegt unter den Bäumen. Das heißt, man muss die Bäume erstmal äh, abrasieren. Das heißt, ähm, das ganze CO2, was in diesen Bäumen gespeichert war, ist schon mal in die Atmosphäre freigesetzt worden. Ähm, dann ist es so, wenn man alleine das Teersandöl, was man da aus, der Bode, aus dem Boden holen möchte, wenn man das alles wie geplant verbrennt, dann ist allein... Also dann wird allein durch dieses Verbrennen schon so viel CO2 freigesetzt, dass das globale Klima, dass, das, äh, dass die globale Temperatur um 0,4 Grad ansteigt. Das würde uns also im jetzigen Stand, das würde also schon ausreichen, um die Erde über das 1,5 Grad Ziel hinüberzukriegen. Und dann ist noch als dritter Aspekt äh, äh, bei diesem Verfahren, wie man also dieses Teersand aus dem Boden holt ich weiß nicht, wird auch Methan oder irgendwas frei, also es ist auch nochmal mit sehr vielem, mit einer sehr großen Emission von, von Klimagasen verbunden. Das heißt, wenn man diese drei Aspekte zusammen nimmt und nur dieses eine Projekt mit dem Teersand nimmt, ja, das ist eins von diesen fünf kanadischen Projekten, die in dieser Liste von Urgewalt stehen, ähm, dann, ähm, dann äh, äh, ist allein das schon äh, im Grunde untragbar, äh, wenn man dem Klima überhaupt noch irgendeine Chance geben will. Und ähm, äh, wie gesagt, solche, ähm, solche ähm, Freihandelsverträge ähm, schaffen eben langfristige Rechtssicherheit und ähm, es ist von daher völlig unverantwortlich, so einen Vertrag zu beschließen mit einem Land, wo also solche fossilen Projekte äh, betrieben werden. Ähm, ich habe jetzt schon hier die, die Zeitansage bekommen, ähm, deshalb noch ähm, ganz kurz, also am vom 19. bis 24. September äh, gibt es eine Aktionswoche, das hat das äh, bundesweite Netzwerk äh, gerechter Welthandel beschlossen, wo der Tag mitarbeitet. Und äh, wir haben also als AG Welthandel, äh, Welthandel und WTO draußen auch einen Stand, wo äh, also Informationen und Flyer und auch zu der Aktionswoche und so weitere Informationen zu finden sind. Um, thank you so much, uh, Thomas. Um, we heard now a lot of things that are wrong uh, with our current uh, trade and investment regime. And before I want to pass the floor to you and the audience to ask questions, make short statements, um, I just wanted to hear from the people on the panel uh, very briefly, like what what is the alternative to the way uh, we're doing trade policy nowadays and what are the, the victories and successes that we already have won in the last uh, years? I think there's quite a bit we can account for and quite a bit we need to still fight for. And yeah, uh, I would ask uh, Nick to start. Okay, so almost what we want, I think, is <clears throat> kind of the opposite in some ways of what these trade agreements do. I think. We want international cooperation that will allow us to deal with climate change, that will allow us to build decent public services, um, that will encourage us to learn how to regulate capital and regulate corporations and regulate investment. So it works in the public interest. And I don't think that's actually as, you know, uh, utopian as it, as it might sound. I mean, if you look at the creation of the current global trade system, after the Second World War, there was a, there was a, the idea behind it was, sure, lower tariffs because we think that will probably help forge full employment and prevent unemployment and we think it will probably help development and if it does, do it, and if it doesn't, don't do it, you know? And it was, and there were lots of exceptions, lots of carve-outs um, and that, like, you know, that was the trade system that existed from the end of the Second World War through to the, um, the 1980s, really. Um, now, I'm not saying that was perfect, but it's interesting that even within modern capitalism, there has been a, a very different way to do, to do trade. I think the other thing you need to look at is, is probably what, what Luciana uh, talked about a little bit, that the terms of trade in basic goods is still um, uh, stacked against the majority of the world in that you know, they sell us raw materials and metals and we sell them expensive process stuff and increasingly services. Um, I don't see how any country is going to be able to develop from that relationship. Like you're never going to get rich selling more avocados. 
So for me, I think the encouragement of, of regional trading systems makes sense. And I think, you know, Luciana, you'll be able to talk more about this, but one of the most exciting things we've seen in the last 25 years was the attempt by the pink tide governments in Latin America to create an alternative trading system which broke that dependency on the old imperial powers, which broke the dependency on the dollar, which was based on solidarity rather than competition. Um, you know, it, it was never as developed as we would like it to have been. There were some examples, but I think at least you have some kind of framework there which you could begin to use for countries, particularly in the global south, to think about how they can trade in a fundamentally different way. So this is a question we always get asked. And yeah, I mean, we don't have like alternatives. What is an alternative to the energy charger treaty? Well, I mean, if you look at the energy charger treaty's objective of, um, you know, like having like a sovereignty in, in energy wise, for example, um, that's not going to happen with the energy charger treaty because I mean, at the end, like these big agreements are really only benefiting big transnational like oligopolies like energy transnational oligopolies which are not precisely the ones that redistribute the wealth like among you know like the the national like the countries no so i think like we really first have to acknowledge that to stop um justifying like the existence of of these fta's because it's 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 hard, no? Like sometimes you say like we don't want FTAs, and they immediately think that you're against progress, or I don't know what <laughs> the problem is, no? But but yeah, so I think we have to continue um, first of all, like demythifying um, that dogma that we have that we need these agreements in order to attract investment, in order to grow, because that has already shown in Latin America, and not only Latin America, but the OECD has also put some reports saying that there is no correlation between FTAs and more um, investment, like foreign investment um, in the countries, no? So if that's like the, that's like the nature of these agreements and that's not even happening, then why do we still need these agreements and who is actually benefiting from all this industry? So yeah, so this idea of like, yeah, like, you know, at the end it's actually going against us as citizens, especially in energy because it's, you know, it's benefiting these big transnational corporations who are only getting richer and richer. We saw that since all of us are going like through the, um, major crisis of oil prices etc the oil companies are getting richer and richer so it's benefiting this type of companies they're not redistributing the wealth plus they are eliminating competition because you know like for smaller national investors who invest in energy it's harder to compete um, in the energy sector if they are not a you know if they don't have like these treaties that protect them for example no? so so yeah so an alternative specifically for the ECT it's not an ECT, so it's actually investing more in like infrastructure, no, like national infrastructure. If you want to do an energy transition, we know that this, a sustainable energy transition is not about having big companies again monopolizing the system. So we don't need to, you know, like change the 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 matrix. We need to change the matrix of going to more renewable energy, but we also need to change the suppliers. So it, they cannot still be the same companies who will lead us to this energy transition. And especially renewable energies, it's all about decentralizing the system. So we really need to, you know, like invest into smaller um, projects of uh, renewables. Yes, we do need a lot of investment. We know we do need money, but that's not necessarily attracted by by the ECT, but by having, as I said, no, like infrastructure, or for example, sometimes like like local policies, national laws that actually, you know, um, incentivize investors to to get into the uh, renewable sector. So that's what we would have to invest in, and not in these FTAs. And also, it's important to acknowledge that all these ISDS cases that we have been saying are costing millions and millions of euros and state resources that are diverting that money that could otherwise be spent for an energy transition. No? So we don't have time now to speak about who is actually benefiting from this, but I can tell you that it's not us and it's not like the energy transition that we want. But at the same time, and you know, it's not like we, we do work also like in, in having like um, mechanisms to control corporations. Um, for example, like 
like the binding treaty or human rights due diligence, like to be able to, you know, also um, bring access to justice to those communities that have been, um, that have suffered a violation by a transnational corporation. So it's like, a, you know, like at the same time that we see that investment law is getting more and more sophisticated with all these agreements that we are seeing, human rights, uh, international law is emptying in content, no? So there's like a complete unbalance there on how we are advancing in this, having like binding regulations, special tribunals for corporations to use. But at the same time, in human rights, we have absolutely no advancements. So, so yeah, so we also have, as an alternative, we, you know, we work also for having like more binding regulations for transnational corporations when it comes to environmental or so human rights um, violations, but that's going <laughs> not in the best um, way possible. So, yeah, we don't have time to talk more about that, but if you go into our website, you can find a lot of information. The alternative is go to our website. <laughs> uh, in my case, I will say that this is something we have been discussing a lot uh, among the Latin American organizations, always the alternatives, try to understand what alternatives. But first, what we want and what we don't want. No more FTAs. First of all, no more FTAs. None of them. Because all of them are awful. I mean, you cannot put more makeup to it to make it better. You cannot add a chapter on gender and trade, as they have done. For example, in the Canada-Chile Free Trade Agreement or the Argentina-Chile Trade Agreement, they included a five pages chapter on gender and trade and uh, Sebastián Piñera and Justin Trudeau said, this is a very modern free trade agreement because it has a gender chapter. So to try to make the feminist movement like at ease, they included a five pages that says nothing. And so we say no, because that's not the important chapter. The important chapter are the ones that actually give you arbitration or give you the possibility to actually try to break any possibility of the other countries who are trying to industrialize, for example. And it gives you all the access of your transnationals to the country. Go and play, kids, you know. So no to FTAs, first of all. No more bids, no more bilateral investment treaties, any of them. And we want to know exactly, listen to this, this is, I'm going to say something so radical that you'll be, you will be, uh, no, no, yeah, I'm going to say it anyway, but I'm, I'm sure that you won't like it. This is super radical. Um, we want to know the numbers of the impacts of the agreements. This is like a socialist proposal, right? You know the basics, this is like the basics. 25 years of free trade agreements and governments cannot show any good impact of any of these free trade agreements. So we know that we have reason on our side, but we have to show that. We have to engage in technical discussion too. It's awful, it's boring, it's numbers, it's laws and blah. But we have people or we need more people to engage in that discussion we, because we have to give the political discussion with uh, parliamentarians, with uh, policy makers, with the media also, uh, you can see now just an example uh, of how this is uh, so radical. The government in Chile of, of uh, Boric, of Gabriel Boric, only during the campaign he said that maybe he was going to revise the Chile's uh, inclusion in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. And the media was right there on, on him like, oh, this is socialist, they want to to cut us off the world, they want to us to not ex import anything, you won't have like the basics to live every day. This was the idea, but the truth is that they don't tell you that Chile imports every day, for example, peas from Canada, peas that any farmer can have in their farm, well, they are imported from the northern country in the Americas to the southern country in the Americas. That is what they, this FTA, so that's no more FTAs, no more bids, and we need audits, commissions, like Ecuador did. We need to know and show people how this has been disgraceful for all of us. And from there, then discuss alternatives. But first, my radical proposition is to actually get the numbers straight and, and discuss from there. Thomas, please. Ja, also eine kleine Ergänzung zu diesem Aspekt mit den äh, Zahlen. Ähm, 
äh, in, der, in der Bundestagsdebatte jetzt als CETA eingebracht wurde, hat eine Abgeordnete also ganz, ganz stolz berichtet, durch CETA wird das Bruttosozialprodukt um 12 Milliarden Euro wachsen. Ja, also 12 Milliarden Euro, das ist nichts. Ja, also wir haben Bruttosozialprodukte in der EU, ich glaube 2017, als, als es anfing mit CETA, die vorläufige Anwendung von 17 äh, Billionen EU, äh, 17, 17 Millionen Euro. Ja? Also 12 Milliarden Euro ist nichts. Und das wird also stolz verkündet als, als, große, ähm, äh, als großer wirtschaftlicher Impuls. Und irgendwie keinem fällt es auf so richtig. Ja? Und das ist ja auch nur einmal. Also das ist ja für ein Jahr. <lacht> Wenn man jetzt die Effekte auf 15 Jahre verteilt, dann ist es äh, weniger als nichts. Ja? Dann, äh, okay, also... Ähm, ja, ich kann an vieles anknüpfen, was schon gesagt wurde. Ich möchte mal, also bei der Frage nach den Alternativen, ich denke, wir müssen wieder dazu zurückkommen, dass das, dass das Völkerrecht, genauso wie wir das ja auch von unserem Recht im Inland verlangen, einfach wieder der Gesellschaft dient und den Menschenrechten dient und die Menschenwürde an oberste Stelle stellt. Und heute natürlich auch die Rettung des Klimas ermöglicht. Ähm, dafür brauchen wir also, es wurde ja, ich glaube, es ist von Luciana in ihrem Vortrag vorhin gesagt worden, die, ähm, dieses ganze Freihandelsregime, also das sind diese bilateralen Verträge, das sind aber natürlich auch die WTO-Verträge, ähm, äh, hat sehr starke Durchsetzungsmechanismen und geht deshalb faktisch, auch wenn es vom, von der juristischen Geltung her eigentlich nicht so ist, aber faktisch stehen sie praktisch über den, den Menschenrechtspakten oder eben auch über dem Pariser Klimaschutzabkommen, ja, weil einfach die Durchsetzungsmechanismen stärker sind. Und das müssen wir beenden. Wir müssen wieder dafür sorgen, dass das Recht wieder, dass praktisch wieder die Menschenrechte und die Rettung des Klimas an oberster Stelle stehen. Und einerseits denke ich, was Nick sagte, ist richtig, wenn man sich betrachtet, wie das... Welthandelssystem vor der WTO funktioniert hat, also als es nur das GATT gab, also als es nur Zölle gesenkt wurden, ähm, da gab es einfach nicht dieses Hineinregieren des Freihandelsregimes in die nationale Politik, sondern die nationale Politik hatte Spielraum und man hat freiwillig international kooperiert und man hat ja eben auch in anderen Bereichen äh, international zusammengearbeitet. Etwa indem man äh, im Rahmen der UNO eine Lösung gefunden hat, um, um die Ozonschicht zu retten. Damals mit den Chlorkohlenwasserstoffen. Ähm, also man war eigentlich in den 70er Jahren schon auf einem ganz guten Weg, was diese internationale Zusammenarbeit wirklich zur Lösung der großen Menschheitsprobleme angeht. Übrigens im, im Brandbericht, also das ist äh, 1980 gewesen, ja, ein UNO-Bericht geleitet diese Kommission von, vom ehemaligen deutschen Bundeskanzler Willy Brandt. Da steht schon die Forderung drin, man sollte doch global ähm, ähm, äh, Kapazitäten bei den erneuerbaren Energien aufbauen. Also hätte man damals, mal, das war vor 40 Jahren, hätte man damals damit angefangen, dann, dann stünden wir da heute woanders. Also jedenfalls, das ist, denke ich, der, der eine Aspekt, äh, äh, dass äh, dieser Zugriff des Freihandelsregimes weggenommen wird, sodass äh, auch in der nationalen Politik wieder mehr Spielraum ist. Und damit eben dann auch Freiraum für, für eine wirklich problemlösungsorientierte internationale Kooperation. Ich will aber auch noch einen zweiten Aspekt einbringen, der jetzt direkt das Völkerrecht betrifft. Es gibt im, im Völkerrecht äh, diesen Begriff des Jus Cogens. Also ich hatte den äh, bis vor ein, zwei Jahren auch noch nicht gehört. Das sind praktisch, also darunter versteht man praktisch bindende Völkerrechtsnormen an die sich auch die Verträge halten müssen, die die Staaten untereinander abschließen. Also die Staaten sind ja eigentlich frei, Verträge zu schließen, wie sie möchten. Ähm, aber es gibt eben diesen, dieses Konzept des Jus Cogens, da sagt man also, äh, bestimmte Dinge sind wie so, eine, wie so Verfassungsnormen, die müssen eingehalten werden, da dürfen sich die Staaten in ihren bilateralen Verträgen nicht drüber hinwegsetzen. Das ist zum Beispiel sowas wie Verbot des Angriffskriegs oder, oder die grundlegenden Menschenrechte. Und, ähm, äh, ein, ähm, und, und ich meine, was wir bei, was wir bei diesem ganzen Freihandelsregime seit Gründung der WTO, also im Grunde die ganze neoliberale Globalisierung hindurch erleben, ist ja, dass sich dieses äh, Freihandelsregime auch völkerrechtlich über die anderen Sachen drüber stellt durch diese starken Durchsetzungsmechanismen. Und ich denke, man muss auch über 
über, mit diesem Konzept des Jus Cogens arbeiten und sagen, ähm, äh, wir, wir, äh, die, die, die Freihandelsregeln, es geht nicht, dass die sich, äh, dass die, ja, also wir, 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 wir gucken, oder <lacht> das Völkerrecht muss den Menschen dienen, es muss der Menschenwürde dienen, es muss, muss dem Klima dienen, es muss der Gesellschaft dienen und nicht den Konzernen. Äh, ein, ein, ähm, eine Idee ist zum Beispiel zu sagen, das Pariser Klimaschutzabkommen zählt eigentlich zu diesem Jus Cogens. Äh, und jetzt gucken wir mal, äh, jetzt gucken wir uns mal CETA an und, und die ganzen anderen Verträge. Ähm, äh, und, und wenn wir feststellen, dass, äh, dass diese Verträge eigentlich dem Pariser Klimaabkommen äh, entgegenstehen und ihm widersprechen, dann äh, beantragen wir beim, äh, beim Internationalen Gerichtshof, äh, also praktisch die Nichtigkeit dieser, dieser Verträge festzustellen. Also das ist jetzt kein Weg, der jetzt äh, sicher zum Erfolg führt. Das ist aber eine Schiene, äh, wo wir denken, dass man, dass man das auch ausprobieren sollte, beziehungsweise man muss, es geht ja auch zunächst mal darum, überhaupt so zu argumentieren, dass man sagt, wir fordern das ein, dass das Völkerrecht wieder vom Kopf auf die Füße gestellt wird und, und nicht irgendwelchen äh, Konzerninteressen dient, sondern dass das der Menschheit dient. Dafür ist es eigentlich da, beziehungsweise man hat natürlich im Recht immer dieses Hin und Her zwischen äh, grundlegenden Menschenrechten und dann Interessendurchsetzung. Aber jetzt ist es wirklich Zeit, mal wieder zu sagen, ähm, wir, müssen, äh, wir müssen dieses Völkerrecht wieder, wieder äh, in den Dienst der, der Allgemeinheit und der Gesellschaft stellen. Thank you so much. Um, now it's the time to discuss and ask questions. Before I do that, I also want to take the opportunity, if you liked uh, what uh, Luciana told you, uh, you can hear much more of that tomorrow and the workshop that uh, Luciana and I hold together tomorrow at uh, 10, uh, 10 in the morning uh, on the EU-Mercosur agreement, the uh, agreement between the South American countries of the Mercosur bloc and the European Union that is uh, not ratified yet, not uh, finalized yet, and which we still try to stop and what it is in it and how we can stop it, you can learn tomorrow morning in the workshop of uh, Luciana and myself. But now I want to give the floor to you. Um, please raise your hand if you have any questions, any statements. I would ask you to go down there um, to the microphone and uh, speak into the microphone. You, of course, very much invited to uh, speak in German or in any other, not any other language. I think French is also okay, uh, <laughs> French or English. Uh, so uh, uh, please, yeah, bitte, uh, then you and then James. Ich denke, die Argumente, warum die, diese Freihandelsabkommen alle schlecht sind, schlecht für die Demokratie und für die Umwelt, die kennen wir alle seit Jahren. Die wurden schon auf anderen äh, äh, Sommerakademien, zum Beispiel in Paris vor einigen Jahren, ausgetauscht. Aber die Frage, wie wir unsere äh, Argumente jetzt durchkriegen, wie wir Druck aufbauen, wie wir mobilisieren, äh, das ist, da muss man sich doch nur mal umgucken, dass hier höchstens zwei Dutzend Leute sitzen und daran erinnern, wie das 2014, 15 war mit den großen Demos, mit hunderttausenden Leuten und auch großen äh, 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 solchen äh, Konferenzen. Äh. Wie kommt es, dass diese Frage, die ja wirklich wichtig für die Demokratie ist, sozusagen in der Öffentlichkeit nicht mehr präsent ist, dass wir verloren haben, dass wir, wir hatten praktisch, weil ja solche Verträge, wenn sie die EU schließt, nicht mehr gekündigt werden können, haben wir einen Schuss. Wenn wir es jetzt schaffen, dass es nicht ratifiziert wird, weil es nicht alle Länder ratifizierten, Ziehen, dann haben wir eine Chance. Wenn erstmal alle Länder ratifiziert haben, dann kann es im Gegensatz zum, zum Beispiel zum ECT ja nicht mehr, kann ein Land nicht mehr austreten. Dann haben wir verloren. Und wie können wir diesen Druck von unten jetzt mobilisieren, wo die Öffentlichkeit äh, eben nicht mehr interessiert ist? Ja.
Yeah, thanks a lot for the four excellent contributions. And of course, it's always difficult to think about alternatives, and I'm not here to give any kind of insightful additions. But I think it's two of you, I, I think, refer to the pre-1995 gut period as a kind of a better system. And in many ways, it was better, but I think ultimately that's is that not a very northern, western-centric perspective? Because if you ask Africans yeah, what happened to them in the post-World War II period or other countries in the global south, they didn't benefit from these gut uh, arrangements either. And I think we need to keep that in mind and rather than going back, look for alternatives elsewhere beyond that period. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, James, uh, so, sorry, uh, and then you. Um, and I wanted, uh, should ask you to state first in which language you're talking. To yeah, of course, you're also very much invited to state your name and your organization or whatever you find important for us to know about you. Uh, but for the interpreters, I think it's most important that you know which language you're starting to talk in. I will speak in English. Um, uh, I'm James, I'm from Global Justice Now. Um, and I just wanted to um, maybe emphasize um, some of the uh, victories that we've actually had, because it, uh, Martin even asked about that. Um, and uh, it, it, it's easy to forget. I think, uh, Luciana, you, 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 you mentioned it uh, in passing, but the, the Ecuadorians actually cancelled uh, 17 of their uh, investment treaties. Um, one of the last things that um, Damn, uh, Correa did before he was out of office. Um, um, and uh, I mean, that actually raises a question then. You know, he was, that was, that was the last the, the part of the, the ebb of the pink tide uh, governments. But now we're seeing with Chile, with Colombia, um, the possibility coming back of, of, of doing things in a different way in, in lots of dimensions. Um, but uh, potentially also in terms of trade, and, 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 and particularly um, uh, uh, in Colombia, in, in Chile, um, you know, there's a lot more talk now about um, the problems of extractivism, about uh, needing to move away from a fossil fuel economy and so on. Um, so maybe that's partly a question for the panel in terms of what, what possibilities there are there, um, and particularly uh, Luciana. Um, but of course, there's a whole history, and a, a previous speaker mentioned it, you know, we had a mass movement that defeated TTIP, right? These things do come in waves. If you go back far enough, you know, there was NAFTA, there was the, there was the beginning of the ECT, there was an attempt to have a multilateral agreement on investment that we defeated. So um, there, are, there are lots of examples of the ways that, I mean, even now Italy has already left the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, you're seeing the possibility now of other countries leaving it. Um, so uh, it seems like when when the issues do somehow become relevant, when we can make them relevant to the things that people s feel are important in that moment, then we have the possibility of, sp of spreading out beyond the, the, the specialists like ourselves, let's say, um, who, who follow these things. And I just wanted to also then mention, we, I've got some booklets here which we've been using in the UK to really make the case to the climate movement that that, uh, that the Energy Charter Treaty and ISDS more generally is an important thing to be working on. Um, so feel free to take one, have a look. Um, we've had some success in doing that, I think, in, in starting to reach out um, to the climate movement and convincing wider layers of people who've been mobilized uh, uh, on, on climate issues that this is an important thing to be working on as well. So uh, do, do help yourself. Ich spreche auf Deutsch, Thomas Thürmeier von Goliath Watch und ich kann mich meinem Vorredner nur anschließen. Also der Sieg damals, Ende der 90er, Anfang der Nuller Jahre gegen das multilaterale Abkommen über Investitionen, das war total geil. Ja? Also wenn man sich vorstellt, wir im Passa, Joschka Fischer, dann sagt man dem, hey, kennst du das MAI? Nee, und so. Oder damals den Anruf im Wirtschaftsministerium, wo die schicken dir einfach den Geheimtext zu, ja, mit den Original. Also, also 
geile Zeit. Und ich, ich glaube, das müssen wir halt sehen, es gibt halt Wellen in Politikfeldern. Ja? Finanzmärkte waren mal halt total cool, da gab es Occupy, Handelspolitik ist halt total unsexy, aber da muss man halt durch und das Thema kommt wieder. Also würde ich uns einfach mehr Mut machen wollen, ja. Und einfach wirklich halt den Punkt finden, jetzt ist das Klima ist halt total sexy jetzt, ja, war mal nicht so sexy, da muss man halt jetzt einfach mal sehen, wo die, wo die Themen halt hingehen, ist leider so in Gesellschaften. Aber auf was ich halt hinweisen will, ist halt, ich glaube, es sind halt zwei, drei Themen, die wir halt sehen müssen. Das erste ist halt, wir haben halt gerade diese thematische Spaltung, auf der einen Seite Due Diligence Lieferkettengesetz, und auf der anderen Seite die Handelspolitik, dass das eigentlich zusammengehört, aber wir in Deutschland halt nicht hinbekommen haben, in der Zivilgesellschaft das zusammenzudenken. Ja, wir haben jetzt zwei unterschiedliche Bewegungen und es war immer total schwierig, das zusammenzubringen. Und das müssen wir wieder weiter hinkriegen. Das wäre das Erste, was ich sehe. Ich weiß halt nicht, wie es in anderen Ländern ist, aber bei uns in Deutschland hat sich das so in zwei Grüppchen gespalten. Da ist halt das Cora, Menschenrechtsgrüppchen und da ist halt, die sind jetzt gerade relativ viele und da ist halt dann das Handelsgrüppchen, die sind jetzt gerade relativ wenig. Und das soll wieder mehr zusammenkommen, weil die Themen zusammengehören. Wir müssen die Menschenrechte in die Handelsverträge reinschreiben, wie es Thomas gesagt hat, und das müssen wir hinkriegen. Und das Zweite ist halt, wir hatten gerade einen riesen Fenster mit den Impfpatenten, wo wir hier in Deutschland ja wirklich so uns total, also die sich die deutsche Bundesregierung ja total daneben genommen hat, um für Biontech ja, einfach die Impfpatente durchzusetzen. Ja. Und das ist einfach total krass. Ja. Also, und da muss man halt fragen, wie kriegen wir eigentlich das hin, dass so Themen einfach dann stärker politisch genutzt werden können für eigentlich, was ein Urhandelsthema ist. Plötzlich war WTO in der Tagesschau. <lacht> ja, also man war das letzte Mal. Also da müssen wir, glaube ich, ein bisschen flexibler werden. Und das Dritte wäre nochmal spannend, wie gehen wir eigentlich mit den Digitaldebatten um? Ja, wir haben die WTO, die jetzt da reingerätscht in die ganzen Themen zu, wie geht man mit Amazon um, wie, geht, äh, wie kriegt eigentlich Facebook und Google oder halt Tencent die Daten global verschoben. Ja, die Debatte um Datensouveränität, müssen wir nicht eigentlich nochmal überlegen, was ist eigentlich Digitalisierung für uns, wenn ich mir den lieben Bayer Monsanto Merger anschaue, da ging es in erster Linie nicht um das Saatgut im TRIPS-Abkommen, sondern ging es in erster Linie um Digitalisierung, wer schreibt das Betriebssystem für die Drohnen und Traktoren und die Daten, die im Kuhstall entstehen. Ja, und das wäre nochmal spannend, wie wir das eigentlich hinkriegen, diese, diese Vernetzung und eine Aktualisierung der Handelsdebatte. Aber lasst uns Mut machen, dranbleiben, das Thema kommt wieder, aber da müssen wir stark sein und dann wieder genauso große Demos organisieren, wie wir es schon mal hatten. Danke. Also ich heiße Isolde und ich spreche Deutsch. Und ich bin auch von dieser AG WTO und Welthandel. Ich möchte es jetzt noch mal sagen, Thomas, also wir denken schon das Lieferkettengesetz und die Freihandelsabkommen und die Handelspolitik zusammen, selbstverständlich. Und auch die Menschenrechte, die eben äh, die, die weniger starken Durchsetzungsmechanismen haben in den Handelsabkommen. Ich will jetzt gar nicht viel an dir, an, bei dir anknüpfen, bei die, an der Frage, was ist jetzt los, 2014, 2015, 2016 war das ist absolut das Top-Thema Handelspolitik und jetzt ist alles erloschen oder passt alles. Das sehen wir auch so und wir haben, nee, wir sehen das so, dass es bei Attac, bei verschiedenen Organisationen und besonders bei Attac ein Wissen gibt über Freihandelsabkommen und auch ein Wissen gibt über das Handelsabkommen CETA und wir haben gedacht, wir müssen, wenn jetzt die Ampelkoalition sich aufmacht, dass innerhalb von drei Monaten dieses Abkommen mit den sch sch schlimmen Folgen, die ich jetzt nicht wieder aufzählen will, durchzujagen, müssen wir nochmal die Ressourcen ähm, mobilisieren und heben, die es bei Attac gibt. Deswegen haben wir da draußen den Infostand gemacht und möchten eigentlich euch bitten, euch zu beteiligen. Ja? Euer Wissen, auch eure sozialen Beziehungen, ähm, all das, was da war, nochmal zu mobilisieren gegen dieses CETA-Abkommen, weil dieses CETA-Abkommen ist ein Abkommen, was beispielgebend sein wird zum Ausbau eines weiteren umspannenden Handelsregimes. Ähm, Unsere Vorschläge didaktischer Art sind die, das zunächst mal zu reduzieren. Also wir wollen uns konzentrieren auf diese Frage ähm, Konzernklagerechte und das, diese Folgen für das, die Klimapolitik in den Vordergrund zu stellen. Und wir halten es für wichtig, dass wir also da 
zusammen mit den anderen Organisationen im Netzwerk gerechter Wendelhandel erstmal diese dezentralen Aktionen mitmachen und dann weitersehen, wie wir Potenziale entfalten können. Also ich würde euch bitten, das ernst zu nehmen, vielleicht auch noch mal an unseren Stand zu kommen, dass wir überlegen können, wie wir diesen Protest jetzt sehr konkret verbreitern können. Danke. Mein Name ist Gabriele, ich bin von Attac Lübeck und meine Empörung damals gegen die Freihandelsabkommen haben mich überhaupt zur Arbeit bei Attac gebracht. Ähm, danke. Ähm, jetzt eine Antwort wollte ich gerne auf dich geben, weil ich glaube, dass das ähm, äh, ein Mechanismus ein ganz bewusst eingesetzter Mechanismus ist, um solche äh, Verträge durchzubringen, dass man sie nämlich vorläufig anwendet, so wie jetzt. Das sind viele Jahre, laufen sie schon. Die Leute sagen, ja, was haben wir denn gemerkt? Das tut, das tut ja nicht weh. Das, was wir als Bürger mitbekommen von diesen Handels, wo liegen denn die Gefahren? Wir merken sie nicht. Und äh, dass das eben ein, ein Grund ist, weshalb äh, viele eben auch dieses Thema so ad acta gelegt haben und gemeint haben, ja, dieser ganze Aufruhr, das, das, war doch, das hat sich doch alles gar nicht so gezeigt und bewahrheitet, was dort äh, angedroht wurde mit diesen Verträgen. Äh, das, glaube ich, gehört mit dazu. Und dann habe ich aber äh, noch eine, oder wolltest du was sagen? Ja, so, okay. Und dann habe ich noch eine Frage an Thomas. Äh, auf welcher Basis sollen denn jetzt diese ähm, äh, Verbesserungen oder diese Entschärfungen, wie, wie sollen die denn jetzt formuliert werden, äh, wenn man das in, innerhalb dieser Möglichkeiten der Ausschüsse machen will? dann kann man doch aber auch genauso gut rechnen, dass dann die Gegenseite auch wieder einen Ausschuss bildet und das wieder zurücknimmt. Also das ist doch überhaupt nichts, was langfristig abgesichert werden kann, um mit diesen Verträgen dann in entschärfter Form zu leben. Danke. Moment, Moment. Uh, Leo, sorry, you wanted to ask something? I, th I think there's a time for another question, and then I would say we have a last round on the panel. Um, please. Thinking about uh, kind of the work that we all do and and really like where we're going wrong, I think, and how we're not appealing to like all of the people who were here who cared about capitalism, why aren't they here? Because we're effectively fighting for the same thing. Um, and I know there's obviously other workshops, I, I don't think that's it, you know, entirely, entirely our fault. Um, but I mean, I think like there is, I fully agree with having like this very uh, progressive stance on just saying like no more FTAs, like that's, we, we don't need any FTAs. And also with like asking for the, the benefits of, of these FDAs. But like for the UK government, sorry, for the UK government, they don't care. They just want to sign trade deals because more like politicians love doing a thing. They want to sign a thing, you know? And I'm kind of trying to then think pragmatically, how do we take advantage of that to, in the context where we have um, like more plurilateral sort of uh, initiatives at the World Trade Organization, it's really hard to, to get rid of a, a big organization like the WTO. Like we've, we've been trying for a really long time. It's hard. They don't, people don't like to get rid of things because there's some things that are really important in there, like special and differential treatment and common and differentiated responsibilities. So is there, is there a value in proposing something, some sort of plurilateral mechanism whereby you would have countries that sign up to have c between each other sort of collaborative, collective, uh, like progressive policy space where they would agree not to enforce uh, this sort of like hard law upon each other, where they're going to prioritize SDT and CBDR, um, in addition to sort of having outsider voices saying absolutely no more FTAs. Um, and 
yeah, I had lots of other their thoughts but that was kind of the main one and like if we were going to propose something that tried to take advantage of that that kind of desire to, to sign something new is there something that we could create that supersedes international trade law um, itself whether it's the kind of the I and mean, we've seen some initiatives around that and there are in theory sort of like carve outs within the WTO uh, principles, but they've never really been successfully applied. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you all for your questions and interventions. Um, I would give now the opportunity to everybody on the panel to uh, answer the questions or reflect on the interventions that you had. Uh, I wrote down like a couple of specific questions that some of you might want to answer just to remind ourselves of them. So there was the question about CETA that was directed uh, to Thomas. Uh, then the last question by uh, Lear on the plurilateral mechanism. Uh, then there was also the broader but not less important question, how, how can we actually win? How are we able to make our voices and arguments heard? Um, then the question that I think was directed uh, to Luciana on like what are the prospects in in terms of uh, trade and investment policy with the, like, the new progressive governments that we see now emerging in uh, Latin America. And also the question of uh, how to connect the struggle for human rights uh, and trade. And also the question on yeah, what, what's this new monster that is digital trade and how can we fight it. Uh, so I would start with you, Thomas, and then go Nick, Lucia, and Luciana to end. Please try to keep yourself not too long because yeah, we have 11 minutes left. Also, ich fange mal mit ähm, deiner Frage an. Ähm, also, in, in, das ist jetzt hier gar nicht thematisiert, oder habe ich gar, nicht, gar nichts darüber gesagt, aber in CETA und den ganzen anderen neueren äh, EU-Handelsverträgen werden äh, Ausschüsse eingerichtet, ähm, ähm, wozu man also auch lange Vorträge halten kann. Ähm, und ähm, die, da sitzen also die beiden Handelspartner drin. Also das ist jetzt kein Ausschuss nur von Europa, sondern das, äh, das sind Ausschüsse, da sitzen die Kanadier drin, jetzt bei CETA äh, und die Europäische Union. Für die Europäische Union sitzen da Vertreter der Kommission drin. Ähm, äh, in CETA, wie in den meisten anderen Verträgen, werden eine ganze Reihe von Ausschüssen äh, eingerichtet. Jetzt ist es aber so, ähm, dass... Ähm, wir ja eben noch in der vorläufigen Anwendung sind bei CETA und der Investitionsschutz noch nicht vorläufig angewendet wird. Ähm, deswegen ähm, werden auch ein paar ganz bestimmte Artikel noch nicht, gelten noch nicht, ja, man kann sich noch nicht darauf berufen, die diesen Ausschüssen äh, durchaus die Kompetenz geben würden, ähm, den Investitionsschutz, die Investitionsschutzbestimmungen nicht nur auszulegen, sondern auch zu ändern. Also nach CETA geht das, dass diese Ausschüsse die Bestimmungen ändern, aber die werden eben noch nicht vorläufig angewendet, diese Bestimmungen, und deswegen kann man, sich, kann man damit im Moment noch nichts machen. Das heißt, das Einzige, was bleibt, ist, dass dieser oberste Ausschuss, der sogenannte gemischte CETA-Ausschuss, dass der seine allgemeine Kompetenz zur Auslegung des gesamten CETA in Anspruch nimmt. Das kann er also jetzt schon machen, auch in der vorläufigen Anwendung. Das heißt, dieser gemischte Ausschuss kann jetzt sagen, wir interpretieren die Bestimmungen zum Investitionsschutz so und so. Deswegen habe ich vorhin gesagt, das ist alles sehr vage, weil natürlich, wenn ich Dinge nur auslegen kann, ist die Frage, ja, wie weit reicht das dann? Also wenn, wenn da steht die Investoren können sich auf ungerechte und unbillige Behandlung berufen. Was will ich dann mit einer Auslegung groß anrichten? Ich kann natürlich sagen, ja, das ist ganz eng zu verstehen und so, aber es ist auf jeden Fall eine sehr unsichere Sache. Und am Ende ist ja dann das Schiedsgericht, das Investitionsschiedsgericht, was am Ende gebildet wird, das ist zwar gebunden an die Auslegung des gemischten CETA-Ausschusses, das ist schon so, das ist schon verbindlich für die, aber es steht auch in CETA drin, dass sich dieses Investitionsschiedsgericht äh, an die äh, Wiener Vertragsrechtskonvention zu halten hat. Also praktisch den völkerrechtlichen Vertrag, wo ganz allgemein drin festgelegt ist, wie internationale Verträge auszulegen sind. 
Und ähm, da steht eben dann noch wiederum drin, äh, was eben als Auslegung noch durchgeht und was nicht mehr. Das heißt, am Ende ist das Investitionsschiedsgericht in der, in der Position zu entscheiden. Also im Grunde kann es sagen, ja, hier, was der gemischte Ausschuss interpretiert hat, äh, das geht über seine Kompetenz und da halten wir uns jetzt gar nicht dran. Ja, deswegen ist das alles sehr, sehr unsicher. So, ich kriege ja schon die Zeit. Also noch ganz kurz zu den anderen Sachen. Ähm, äh, ist, ähm, was ich auch denke, da möchte ich James recht geben, ist, dass wir also den Schulterschluss mit der, mit der Klimabewegung suchen sollten. James, wir haben auch schon vor zwei Jahren hier so ein Factsheet gemacht, wo wir diese allgemeinen Zusammenhänge aufgezeigt haben. Wir haben es auch draußen am Stand, kann man sich also bedienen zwischen Handelspolitik und, und Klimapolitik. Und ich denke, dass in der jetzigen Situation ja auch die Klimabewegung nicht mehr in der Position ist zu sagen, ach, ihr wollt uns nur instrumentalisieren, ähm, ihr, ja, weil ihr wollt jetzt bei uns irgendwie auf der Welle mitschwimmen, denn deren Welle ist ja im Grunde auch gerade vorbei, erst durch Corona und dann durch den Krieg. Das heißt, die Klimabewegung hätte auch zu gewinnen, ähm, wenn sie jetzt sich auf diese Aktualität von CETA dranhängt und sagt, äh, dass das natürlich fürs Klima das Allerletzte ist. Ähm, dann nochmal... Ähm, Thomas, ich, ich, ich muss okay. dich bitten, weil wir haben nur noch zehn Minuten. Und noch. Okay, so I understand why people think, you know, the room's not full and therefore, the, it, you know, that's sad for, for those of us who like trade. But I actually think we're probably in a stronger position in some ways than we were 20 years ago. The neoliberal trade juggernaut has ground to a halt. The WTO barely functions. It was, it was, it was you know, facing an existential crisis this year. It scraped through just about. You know, James mentioned... Uh, Uh, Ecuador, but actually lots of countries are ripping up investment treaties, including most recently Pakistan. Um, Spain is saying it might withdraw from the ECT. I think this, the future of the ECT is still very much on a, on a knife edge, whether it will exist or not. You know, South Africa is blatantly ignoring um, intellectual property on um, medicines in its new experiment. This is really exciting stuff, and I think, you know, maybe we just don't want to call this trade anymore. Um, Because, you know, unless there's a specific trade deal in front of us that can galvanize and mobilize people, th those are important moments. But otherwise, some of, the f some of the fights we're talking about here, the activists involved don't conceptualize it as, as trade. And I think, you know, America is really interesting. The United States is really interesting at the moment where they're talking about, you know, the whole problem of offshoring and what that's meant to the working class, where they're talking about monopolies, where they're talking about the problems of big corporations tax dodging. I mean, neither the Democratic leadership nor the Republicans are free trade um, at the moment. That's an astonishing change from what we saw in the 90s. Not, the, not that we like the Republicans, not that we like some of the anti-trade people, right? But it has changed. And so I think the battle now for us is different. It's defining what comes after the death throes of neoliberalism, because it's not like every form of state intervention we're going to like either. So we have to be clearer, I think, about, about um, what it is that we want. You know, I, I think what gave the anti-globalization movement its definition for me was Latin America. Uh, Latin America has not been in a good place um, for a long time now. Is that changing? I hope it is. And I hope that again, that might begin to define a new form of internationalism. I think we can have hope um, in, in that. Um, but by and large, I think what we're calling for here is, is a managed form of, of deglobalization. That doesn't mean we're not in favor of internationalism and separating globalization from internationalism is something we've always struggled with, but we need to do. But I do think we have to deglobalize. Um, To, to, to some degree. We need to take control of finance and constrain it and put it back in its box. That's absolutely central. Uh, we need to take on the monopolies. If people want to call that trade or not, I don't really care. Uh, maybe next time we have a trade forum, let's call it something more exciting. Um, but I think, you know, this is a really, I think all of those issues are actually extremely live. And in some ways, there is a lot more hope than there was in the mid 90s. So just quickly, I mean, oh. I hear my voice. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we have to find somehow like the balance between being experts in specific th issues about the FTAs like ISDS, uh, regulatory cooperation, which, as uh, Nick said, has you know gotten us to like good successes. And I would um, I would add that for the first time the IPCC report acknowledged the 
the role of FTAs for you know um, climate mitigation. So it's very important that you know like we would have not imagined that the most important you know climate review report actually talks also about trade. So that's that's because of all the years um, working on this specificities of the trade agreements that has given us also legitimacy um, among policymakers and other organizations, right? But I think we have to find the balance between that part of being very, like observing with the loop, like the specificities of the system, but also trying not to fragment our analysis and connect them with migration, poverty, inequality, wars, um, energy crisis, because that's the broader picture, and that's why we, you know, want the FTAs not to exist. So, you know, we, we followed one strategy, which was going into the specific treaties and the content of it, but I think precisely the challenge to keep mobilizing people and, you know, is, yeah, like not fragmenting our, yeah, the analysis, but I don't think it's only specific to trade, I think it's specific to other um, struggles. So I do agree that, you know, in this type of forums, ideally, we would have people from many different struggles getting together and, you know, realizing, like, there's so many things going on geopolitically right now. How do we get, like, one picture out of this? So that's my thought. Okay. Thank you. I use yours. <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with what has been said. Um, especially I was thinking about Birgit's uh, question. Um, we have lost the public, she said, right? And I was thinking about that. And I was thinking that, for example, in the in the last ESU that I participated was in Paris in 2014, I think it was. That's when I first met Nick, actually. And I remember that the program there, there were like a lot of workshops on TTIP. That was the moment for, for TTIP struggles. Now I come here again and I see a lot of uh, workshops on Ukraine war. Of course, this is what's going on and you're worried about that. But the thing is that the conditions have changed a lot. Nick was saying we have learned a lot in this past 20, 20 years from Seattle battle to now. And actually, the actors that we had in the first World Social Forum when we started discussing ALCA, for example, in Latin America we were discussing ALCA, have changed a lot if we see now. So the thing is, how do we engage with the new, more dynamic actors, the most dynamic actors in, in the world right now, maybe you are, maybe, maybe you agree or not, but are the climate movement and the women movement. So the thing is that we shouldn't be talking about trade, we should be talking at, about what, as I said before, we have to talk about how illogical and irrational trade system is, that is the heart of the system. When you say change the system, not the climate, the banner of global justice now outside, we have to make people understand how trade is in the heart. Trade and investment regime are in the heart of the capitalist system, of, of the system that is like so wide and so abstract. We have to explain that because if we engage the climate movement, if we engage the feminist movement in the struggle against FTAs and, and investment regime, then you have the new momentum. Because it's not us talking to ourselves about oh yes, how awful the system is. We already know that. The thing is, how do we give a new dynamic in this new moment when these are the, the, the movements that are actually out in the streets, saying things in Latin America, nothing can happen if the feminist movement is not there. So that is the thing we should try to approach those movements and tell them, do you know exactly how the trade agenda affects women? No, you don't, because you don't have the numbers. You don't even know how to. We know in, in theory, but it's time to actually go deeper into that. That is not easy. We need the people, we need the money for that. We need the new tools of communicating the impacts of trade and investment agenda. So it's always a new, uh, a new moment that we have to see, but we have to stop, like in football, in soccer, sorry. We have to stop the ball and analyze who are we talking to. And that is something that we should do, and I would really like ESU to be doing that, to have more spaces where we discuss strategy. I'm, I'm really unhappy that we don't have that in these three, four days we're together, but we have to see, well, maybe in the corridors is a space to start trying to strategize a bit. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, so go out, strategize in the corridors. Thanks to the interpreters. <laughs> and see you soon. Bye.